Fish is still over 100 feet away after that big run. He is staying down. He's bulldogging. He is bulldogging. He's fine. I am content to let him wear himself out down there. Eighty-five feet back. Man, these fish fight so hard. It's about a toss-up between these or the Trout at Eagle Lake for which ones are the, the fighting champion. These fish fight hard. Just keeping control of the kayak. I'm trying to keep him on that port side. Keep him from going crazy. I'm out here deep enough now where I don't have any concerns about the downward or hanging the bottom. I still have to watch that cable though. And I have a boat coming here on the starboard side. I think I know that guy. He's talking to me, so I think he'll, uh, he'll give me all the room I need. He's starting to come my way. He's 50 feet now. He's gonna go crazy when he sees a pack. He's kind of been resting. He's just kind of swimming along with us at this point. And I'm just not doing anything to dissuade him from doing that. I'm just keeping the reel in motion. Sometimes the harder you fight them, the harder they fight you. Okay, he's getting a little more active now. Just let him do his thing. I'm moving at like 0.8. I'm not moving very fast at all. Just fast enough to keep forward momentum. A lot of head shaking now. Oh! Notice, as long as the line stays tight, when he starts head shaking, I stop reeling. I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to provoke him. He's got a lot of fight left in him. And when he's head shaking, I don't want to provoke him by cranking hard on him. Got a lot of power. A lot of power. Oh, I see him down there. He's got a few copepods on him. Okay. Get the net ready here. Oh, he's hooked a little funny. Kind of wrapped himself. Oh, what a beautiful rainbow. Howdy guys, Kel Kellogg here. Um, I'm gonna ramble a bit in this video and I may have to stop and start the camera some because I'm out here in the woods and uh, the logging guys are out here. They're out here hot and heavy right now. They know it's gonna get muddy so they're doing all they can to get as much timber out of the woods as they can before their roads get all mudded out and they have to stop essentially until spring. So let's get going here. Let's get going down the road. I want to talk to you about a concept I kind of came up with called, called magical thinking for trout anglers. And uh, you know, I get to meet a lot of trout anglers. I'm out on the water a lot, I have a lot of clients. I meet a lot of people that are just out fishing, you know, at the same lakes that I'm fishing at. And one of the things that seems to afflict a lot of trout anglers is magical thinking. And I'll kind of define that in a moment. But uh, if, if it afflicts you, I can tell you, it is holding you back. It is not allowing you to catch as many trout as you should be, and it's not allowing you to catch as many big trout as you should be. And I'm all about helping people catch the maximum amount of trout, the maximum number of trout, and the maximum number of big trout. So I am trying to break the curse of magical thinking as it applies to trout anglers. Now, let me talk a little bit about my lures and my program. I'm a tackle guy. I sell tackle. There are too many tackle guys that would have you believe that their lures work no matter what, all day, every day, no matter where, they just always work. That is a blatant, and I would tell them to their face, that is a blatant, bold-faced lie. It is a lie. There is no bait, even power bait, that works all day, every day under any conditions, okay? Here's how my lures were developed. It's a chicken and egg scenario, okay? 
the lures were not developed first. The first thing I developed was a method. My method of catching trout is what makes it happen. Then I went on the backside and I developed my own set of lures that plug in to my method. Now, if you look around here on the channel, do some searching, you can get an in-depth instruction. You can find in-depth instruction as to the method, but I'm gonna put it in a thumbnail right now. Here's my method in a thumbnail. You hit a lake, any lake. I don't care if you're in California, in New York, or in Australia. You hit the lake, you need to take into consideration the environment. You need to get as much information about the lake as possible. When you physically get to the lake, you need to check out things like the surface temperature, the water clarity. What is the weather trend been? That's one part of it. But my method revolves around this concept. You start out fast and large, okay? Fast for me, 2.7 to three and a half miles an hour. You start out fast with large, aggressive lures. Your Rapalas, Speedy Shiners, Speed Spoons, Trolling Flies, big and aggressively fast, and you work the lake. And you watch your sonar and you take note of what's going on. You're looking for areas that hold fish and you're also looking to catch a fish or two or three or five or whatever that number is, or maybe just even get a bite. But what you're really looking for is to figure out which areas on the lake are holding fish, okay? Usually, even if you catch fish early going fast, the, the bite is gonna wane and you're gonna have to slow down and downsize. As we slow down, we downsize. As we slow down, the lures get softer and more seductive. Fast for me, two seven to three and a half. Medium speed, 2.2 two to 2.7, 2.8, okay? That's where I start to integrate more trolling flies into the spread. Maybe at the lower end of that speed range, I start to get the soft plastics involved. Slow for me is 1.5 to 2.2, that speed range. 1.8 is usually my target speed, at least in my boat, because that's about as slow as I can go. When I'm down at 1.8, I am looking for lures that are soft, seductive, have a lot of action and stay in the strike zone for an extended period of time. Because generally, when I get down in the low end of the speed range, the trout have told me that they are not on a red hot bite. They are somewhat lethargic. They are neutral fish. They are not willing to chase. They are not willing to jump on the speedy shiner going four miles an hour. They need to be coaxed into hitting. Right now in Northern California, I don't care where you go in the foothills, the bite has been more difficult than usual. The conditions are not what we usually see in the fall. Our lakes are much higher than they usually are at this time of the year, and that has affected the bite. And there are things going on that I don't understand. For some reason, a lot of the trout at Comanche, Collins, Folsom, and different places like that are gravitating to the shoreline earlier than I would expect them to. That's why at a lot of places, we are seeing bank anglers doing better for the trollers. Do you wanna take your big sled up within eight feet of the bank to troll? I certainly don't, I'm scared to go up there. So is everybody else. Now for a bank angler targeting a trout that's six feet off the shoreline, simple deal. That's why bank anglers are scoring better than trollers while using power bait and spoons. There are guys at Collins Lake right now sight fishing for big lightning, fit, lightning trout rather off the bank with spoons. They're seeing the fish, they're presenting the lure, and they're catching those fish virtually at their feet. That's not a place that I control. I have been working the surface of the lake offshore where there are, unfortunately, less trout, and I'm having, I'm having to work for every single strike. I'm getting fish every day and I'm getting some big fish, but I'm having to work for them a lot harder than the guys that are able to fish adjacent to the bank. Now, here's where the magical thinking comes into play, okay? You get out on the lake and maybe you catch a few fish, maybe you don't, maybe you're catching fish on needlefish and the bite slows down and you put on some worms and you still catch a few fish and then the bite goes dead. Guys assume, especially when you're trolling, that there is some magical, mythical, unicorn 
type lure that you are going to put on and you are going to make those fish bite. The fact of the game is there are periods throughout the day, sometimes short periods, sometimes long periods, sometimes a period goes on all day when the fish simply will not strike. They won't strike a cripple lure, a trout tricks worm, a Rapala, or anything else you pull. There is no magical lure, okay? That is one rut guys fall into. The fish stop biting and it's, man, let's, let's, let's play the, the magical lure game and change lures every five minutes and fish everything in our tackle box. That seldom pays off. Rarely does it pay off, especially when the fish have already shown you that they are lethargic. They are on the edge. They don't really want to bite. You're getting short strikes. You're losing fish. Fish are falling off in the net. These are all things that are telling you they are not committing to your bait. They're not in the mood to feed. You're getting some strikes, but they're just not really wanting to go. Okay, that's what I call taking the fish's temperature. You've got to listen to the trout. They will tell you what they want or don't want just based on how they respond to your lures and your presentations, okay? Speed range is the heart and soul of my method. You need two or three approaches that work well at the high end of the speed frame. You need two or three approaches that work well at medium speeds, and you need two or three approaches that work well at the low end of the speed range, and that's really about it. Okay, if you just concentrated with nine different presentations, three fast, three medium, and three slow, and then worried about your approach on the water and let the fish train you how to be a better trout fisherman, you'd be way ahead of the game. The other thing that I run into a lot are guys that really don't know what to do, but they see the cool guys on the internet. They see the cool guys on YouTube. You know what the cool guys pull right now? Cool guys all pull speedy shiners at, you know, around three miles an hour. That is a fantastic approach when it works. It's not an approach to use all day, every day, at every lake you fish because you're going to be disappointed a lot of the time. Okay, that speed trolling's nothing new. It was very popular back in the early 90s. And then it went away and now it's back again and these trends come and go and they you know they that's what they do you need to be a fundamentally solid fisherman you need to be able to present lures across the spectrum of speeds a spectrum of different lures to enable yourself to catch fish under virtually any conditions i hear a truck coming i'm going to get back to that Well, that was probably the sixth logging truck we've seen come out of here in about the last half hour. So those guys are working hard. They must have a big raft of cut timber up here somewhere and they're just steadily hauling it out. I'm up here by Forest Hill, California. So they're taking that down to be processed down by Lincoln, California. So they got a little bit of a drive ahead of them once they leave the woods here. But again, they're trying to get it out of here before the roads get all muddy and messy and they're unable to get the wood uh, out of the woods until the spring. Back to the trout. So what you're looking for is you know at the center of my method is speed you want two or three fast presentations two or three fat uh two or three medium speed presentations and two or three slow speed presentations and and that's gonna do you well that's gonna prevent you from playing the magic lure game get very comfortable with those nine different presentations and stick with them and then allow that lake, allow those trout to make you into a better trout fisherman, all right? Some guys assume because I'm not pulling a certain lure, it doesn't work. I'll bet you I've been asked a half dozen times this past week when I was out pulling trigger minnows and trout tricks worms, well, you're pulling, you know, soft plastics. You don't like grubs anymore? I love grubs. Grubs are fantastic but I didn't like them last week and I'll tell you why. They only checked two of the three boxes I needed to check. I needed a lure that moved slow 
with a lot of action so it stayed in the strike zone, I needed a soft bait that when the trout touched it, it would feel real, okay? Those are two of the boxes, but I also needed a bait that had the hook near the rear end. There's a good friend of ours up at the lake and he's been playing with grubs. His name's Joey and he's been getting a lot of short strikes. He's getting the trout to hit the grub, but when you think about a grub, a three inch grub has a tail that's approximately an inch and a half long. That means when a trout comes up to get the bait, to get hooked, he's gotta get an inch and a half of that bait in his mouth before he ever gets to the hook. And when the trout are tentative and they're nipping, that's not gonna happen. And what you're gonna end up with is a bunch of short strikes. Fish that came in, grabbed the tail, didn't get hooked, peeled off and went away. That's what's gonna happen. My worms and my minnows allow me to get that hook point right back near the tail of the bait. When I'm trolling flies a lot of a lot of the time right now, I'm running a stinger hook on them for the same reason. The trout are coming in nipping. Little details like that, they can get you three or four fish on days when other guys are getting skunked. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when you got four fish in your box and everybody else on the lake is getting skunked, it's a big deal, believe me. So little details like that, it, the temperament of the fish, again, are dictating which baits I'm pulling and how I'm rigging those baits. I, again, I'm not knocking anyone, but I do want to talk to you about one more thing that holds anglers back, and it's a combination of doing what the cool kids do and magical thinking, and that's overusing your downriggers. The downriggers are not the answer to every problem. Here comes another logging truck. I'll finish up this thought and we'll be out of here. I'm back. So when it comes to trout trolling, downriggers are not the answer to every problem, okay? If the trout are in the top 20 feet of the water column, there's really no reason to deploy your downriggers, all right? You can do just as well top lining using lead core and pulling weights. In fact, you can do better using lead core if the fish are in the top 20 than you'll do uh, using your downriggers. That's just the way it is. I got a quick story before I get out of here. So last spring, I'd had an exceptional week. I was catching a lot of fish on trolling flies, fish up to and beyond 10 pounds. I mean, I was smoking them. I think it's the week that I caught, uh, or one of my clients caught, I put him on it. He got an 11 and a quarter pound trout on a number eight junior trolling fly, pulled about one foot deep at one o'clock in the afternoon. Huge fish right up on the surface. Remember, the most active trout are always going to be on top of the biomass. When the water is cold, the most active trout are right under the surface. If you're at Shasta in the summertime and the main biomass is 90 feet deep, the most active trout are gonna be at 75 and 80 feet deep. That's just the way it is. It's the same way with ocean salmon. The most active fish are on top of the biomass. Those are the ones that are most likely to feed. Anyway. I'm out at the lake, a guy gets a slip next to mine. I've been smoking all these fish and he asked me what I've been doing, but he didn't really want to know what I was doing. He wanted me to mandate what he intended to do. He said, well, what are you pulling off your downriggers? Nothing, zero, nothing. I'm pulling nothing off my downriggers. I hadn't used them in months and had no intention of using them anytime soon. I was catching fish, you know, up to about 11 pounds right under the surface. Why would I deploy my downriggers? Of course, I didn't act like that to the guy. I said, no, there's really no reason to use your downriggers. The trout are all up top, blah, blah, blah. I'm using trolling flies. Well, he says, oh, I'm going to pull spoons. I'm going to pull big spoons. That wasn't the pattern then. You're not going to catch anything on them. But okay, whatever. This is America. Do whatever you want. And then he, he said the quote that stuck with me. Well, yeah, you can catch fish up top, I guess. But if I catch a fish down deep off my downrigger, it's going to be something worth catching. I, I pondered that. What the hell did he think he was going to catch? A marlin? A tuna? A great white shark? I was catching fish up to 10, 11 pounds right under the surface. And I fish every day. But he was convinced if he dropped his downrigger down to 40 feet, he was going to be doing what the cool kids do, and he was going to catch something, and I quote, worth catching. I can't argue with that. 
I, I can't I can't help you with that kind of thinking. So just kind of remember these points I've tossed out there. This comes on top of thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of field experience. It comes on top of, of fishing probably 200 days a year for the last four years when I've been a full-time professional trout guide, guys. I can tell you, my methodology absolutely works. It'll work even better if you plug my lures into the equation. All this stuff is up on the channel. You can get tutorials on anything I've just talked about. Don't play follow the leader. Don't get stuck in a rut. Don't play the magical lure game and don't over rely on your downriggers. They're a great tool when you need them, but the fact is late fall, winter, early spring, you don't need them. You will catch more fish using my hybrid lead core system than you will catch on your downrigger. I get comments to that effect all the time. It has become a statement of fact. Again, I want to see you guys catch as many trout as possible and as many big trout as possible. And that's why I'm here on YouTube doing these videos. I will catch you next time. If you'd like to get out on my boat, um, my winter season's coming to a conclusion here pretty fast at Collins. I'm going to be up there through mid-December. Um, and uh, also, by all means, check out my tackle um, at FHSFishing.com. That's where you can check out my guiding calendar. And you can also pick up the most effective delivery system that you can have on your boat during the cold water months. That is one of my iconic yellow hybrid lead core rods. They outfish downriggers when the fish are near the surface usually three or four to one so anyway believe it or not i'm out of here for now i'm kel kellogg you have a wonderful day take this advice to heart i know i've been rambling it is going to change the level of success you enjoy when you're out trout fishing catch you later